Metroidvanias have been one of the longest standing subgenres that has graced the video game scene. Almost always associated with 2D style platformers, they were essentially a divergence from the traditional method of 2D side scrollers. In platforming games such as Super Mario Bros., your main challenges are simply to avoid enemies and obstacles while trying to get to the end of a level. A simple and linear approach, but that's the joy of 2D platforming because it's meant to be easy for just about everyone to pick up. Of course, there are nuances and specific characteristics with many different types of games, but that's exactly what makes each and every one of them unique. Differences in mechanics and design can change the game entirely. One of the biggest changes was the Metroidvania, a subgenre that was coined as a result of the Metroid and Castlevania series. The primary gameplay mechanic was that, rather than taking a linear approach to the 2D platforming to finish a level, they took a more non-linear approach to the gameplay design. Levels themselves had multiple ways to branch out into other levels, and the progression was never truly straightforward. Oftentimes, objectives would be scattered throughout the map, and backtracking to previous levels for progression was needed. Another major aspect of it was that there was no real direct objective you had to follow. Most games in this genre simply had you start it and pretty much figure it out for yourself. But what that would entail is you discovering the map world and seeing what objectives and puzzles need to be accomplished before you can move forward, appealing to the player's sense of discovery and progression independently of the game instructing them. This sort of explorative nature and figuring out the world has been the most favored aspect of the subgenre and why it still has modern incarnations even today. Games like Hollow Knight, Axiom Verge, Ori and the Blind Forest, or the eventual release of Silk Song, maybe one day, have also carried the torch of their forebearers to the modern scene. But many of these games would not exist had it not been for the influence of two games that pioneered the genre, Super Metroid on the Super Nintendo and Castlevania Symphony of the Night for the PlayStation. While not technically the first in their respective series to create the quote-unquote explorative Metroidvania formula, Super Metroid and Symphony of the Night were primarily responsible for establishing the best parts of what made Metroidvania fun. At the time, Super Metroid was praised for its non-linear gameplay, allowing the player to freely navigate and discover the world, while allowing Samus to acquire permanent upgrades that she can use over the course of her adventure. With Symphony of the Night, its inclusion of RPG mechanics, updated graphics, smoother gameplay, and its gothic vampiric setting helped further establish the hallmarks of what makes the Vania portion of the Metroidvania so great. While I would like to talk about Symphony of the Night further one day, Super Metroid gets the spotlight today as it was the first of the two to be released. I've been a fan of Samus' games since the first time I got to play Metroid Fusion on the Game Boy Advance. Since then, I've pretty much enjoyed every incarnation of the Metroid franchise, old and new. That being said, Super Metroid was released in 1994, and it has been 30 years since then. Many of the Metroidvania games today are arguably the evolution of Super Metroid with modern iterations and nuances that improve upon its formula. Even its own franchise has made many updated incarnations across the generations that came after it. Despite being a retro title, does the game still hold its weight and relevance even 30 years after its release? Well, let's take a look. Loading up the game for the first time, I was immediately reminded of how Super Metroid tries to establish the overall tone and atmosphere right from the get-go. Although brief, the sense of dread, get it, and foreboding atmosphere still felt somewhat impactful to me despite the game's age. It honestly feels like a horror game, and the only other one I can think of on the SNES is Clock Tower. In any case, Super Metroid isn't shy about setting their tone right from the start. When you begin the game, Samus gives a brief rundown of her previous missions, aka her first two games. While I wouldn't call Super Metroid's story its biggest selling point, the inclusion of Samus's adventures and the overall plot does a good enough job in establishing the sci-fi setting of Super Metroid. After bringing the player up to speed, she's finally called to action and you're starting the game right off the bat. Jumping back into the controls of Super Metroid's Samus, while I wouldn't necessarily call her controls the slowest in the world, she definitely feels tanky. Her initial movement when she propels herself forward does feel a bit weighty, and momentum isn't as forward pushy. Getting used to the run button is also something I had to think about on occasion while adjusting to the controls. 
While I would say that it's mainly a product of its time, and it does feel a bit dated now, I was nevertheless able to naturally control her after a few minutes. By the time it was required of me to rigorously shoot enemies, platform, and weapon swap where needed, I had no problems using any of these mechanics whatsoever, even using the wall jump on occasion. After fighting Ridley, escaping the station, and landing on Zebes, the core gameplay aspect began. Jumping back into the gameplay loop, or, and this is kind of weird to say, the Metroidvania aspect of Super Metroid, it felt extremely normal to me. After finally coming back to Super Metroid, having played a plethora of modern Metroidvania titles alongside its recent title Dread, it still felt extremely fun and natural to explore Zebes, even at the behest of Super Metroid's controls. Exploring the different room locations, pathing my way around the different map sections, finding each weapon and suit upgrade to unlock the next room, and looking for secrets, still felt fun and familiar even in the older Metroid formula. I would say that the only minor gripes I have with exploring came in the form of backtracking to certain areas that had one-way locks as well as the lack of teleporting. Though I didn't really mind this as much since the total map didn't feel as large as some of the more modern titles, so I was okay with taking the roundabout. There were definitely a couple of times that I had to be thorough with looking for hidden entrances in rooms in order to progress the game. It was primarily small little nooks that you needed to use bombs or certain weapons in order to open them up. Sometimes when I forget to do that, I did feel a bit lost and I had to rethink which rooms I needed to go through. This is definitely a defining feature of Super Metroid's design and something I had to get used to again in order to complete the game. I think that if this is your first time trying Super Metroid, you will definitely feel lost as you try to get around the map and look for very specific progression routes. On the plus side, you do in fact have an actual map so you don't feel totally lost, and you can always look for map rooms to make your progression a lot easier. Fighting enemies in Super Metroid was a pretty basic affair. You pretty much just shoot them, and if they're tougher, shoot them until they die. Pretty basic, but there is some fun tech to be had when you incorporate missiles, power bombs, and the cannons upgrades into play for some of the tougher enemies. Besides the normal enemies, there are a number of bosses for Samus to fight as well. Some are pretty challenging and require a bit of maneuvering and platforming to get around, while some are more or less simple to defeat. I had fun fighting Kraid for example because of the platforming that was required, alongside trying to hit his weak spot. I still think Dragon takes the cake for the most interesting ways to defeat a boss as you literally electrify yourself in order to defeat it. Krokomire will definitely give me nightmares since his skin literally peeled off his bones and nearly came back to kill me. Surprise, motherfucker! Overall, I had fun with the bosses even if they weren't the most complicated to defeat. They're a bit of a standard affair, but impose a challenge to your overall platforming and combat ability. Moving on to the presentation side, it's obvious that this Super Nintendo game has its retro 16-bit aesthetics and it's definitely a product of its time. I think whether you find this game appealing is dependent on how much you appreciate retro aesthetics, especially since this is the actual 16-bit source. For me, pixelated graphics still hold a lot of appeal, whether they are meant to invoke the older generation or are actually of the older generation, they have a very distinct style that never really gets old for me. While it's obvious that Super Metroid is running at its 16-bit processing power, there's a certain retro-only Metroid feel that I really like about this game. The pixel design of the environments, Samus herself, and the enemies feel unique to Super Metroid and it's the blending of everything that makes me appreciate its older pixelated graphics. Again, your mileage may vary and I think it's fine if retro aesthetics aren't really your thing. The sound effects are definitely Metroid to a T. From the more sci-fi sounding aspects of Samus's suit and weapons, to the more organic sounds of the enemies and movement, everything feels like it's Super Metroid appropriate, so no issues on that front. The music still sounds really good to me. Yes of course, it still has that 16-bit crunch and arguably a little dated in its soundscape, but the iconic soundtracks among Super Metroid's levels still sound distinct even today. All of them sound distinct and fit the tone of Super Metroid very well. To wrap things up, before I took the plunge, I thought a lot about how the modern Metroidvania games I played would affect my playthrough of Super Metroid, specifically when it comes to controls and gameplay. 
Although it's a little unfair to compare a much older title, it does feel a lot slower to handle by comparison to its more modern counterparts. Not to mention Super Metroid by comparison now feels like the most vanilla Metroidvania experience. What I mean by this is that modern Metroidvania games incorporate specific elements that make them more than just a simple Metroidvania. Hollow Knight's RPG system, charms, characters, story, and atmosphere are what elevates it beyond the basic Metroidvania design. Games like Rogue Legacy and Dead Cells to an extent incorporate the use of roguelite mechanics to make each run feel fresh and unique, putting a much more replayable spin on the formula. Even Metroid Dread itself included updated combat and weapon mechanics alongside various suitabilities and upgrades to further refine Samus's gameplay. So while these games have clearly evolved beyond the scope of Super Metroid's intended design, is it still fun to play? I think so, actually. Despite being one of the most basic Metroidvanias, that's actually what I appreciate a lot about playing it again. You're getting the bare bones experience, and the reason I can appreciate it is because that design has held up many years later by virtue of every Metroidvania style game that came after it. Not only did it feel fun and normal for me to play through it, the Metroidvania feeling was never lost on me, and that's why I feel like it still holds up. Though I can only speak for myself personally, I think there are a couple of things to consider if you do go back to this game or if you're trying it out for the first time. I think the most important thing is gameplay. Ultimately, whether or not the Super Metroid formula holds up for you, and whether you're willing to deal with some of the more dated aspects is something you have to think about. Things like tankier controls, room scouring, and obtuse pathing are definitely going to feel sluggish to you, especially if you've played more modern Metroidvania titles. Again, this is the most vanilla experience, and that's something you have to get used to. Overall, I still had fun with Super Metroid. Despite some of its datedness, it actually helped me appreciate how its core design influenced the games that came after it. Even with modern titles elevating and improving upon its formula, there was still some fun to be had in the original Metroidvania's design. If you're willing to work with its controls and pacing, I think there's something still to appreciate about Super Metroid. And that's it for today, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Metroid has always been a favorite franchise of mine across all of Nintendo's different generations, and I'm happy to see its FPS incarnation back again. Speaking of FPS, I think I'm actually going to take a look at one that's been sitting on my shelf for quite a while, and I have faith that it's going to be fun. But yeah, thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you all next time.